people often say, well, maybe with a sufficient technicality we could build a Schrodinger's cat. That was not what Schrodinger's point was. He was saying, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. You can't really have a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. You suggested that human consciousness might in some way be the result of quantum effects. Could you perhaps tell us a bit about how you came to that view and how that view has developed over the years? Well, the story is a bit long and uh, involved in many ways. I was, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, after having done my undergraduate work in London, University College, I went to Cambridge and I was working on pure mathematics. And I sort of thought, well, three years for my PhD is quite a long time. I can work on other things which might interest me. So I went to three courses which were nothing to do with what I should be doing. One was a course by Bondi on general relativity, which was very influential, <laughs> very influential on what I subsequently did. Another was a course by Paul Dirac, the great physicist, which also was extremely influential in what I did later. The third course was by a man called Steen, who was a mathematical logician. And I learned from his course about Turing machines, which gives a general concept of what you mean by a computation. So I learned about that. And then he described <coughs> Gödel's theorem. I had been worrying a bit about Gödel's theorem. When I say Gödel's theorem, there are two, but you can um, put them into one theorem. Basically, it's one, one statement, which is the important thing. Um, I'd heard about it, but I didn't quite like the idea because it seemed to say there were things in mathematics you couldn't prove. And I was a little bit worried by that. Anyway, so I went to this course, and what I learned was something very different. And it's if you have a system of rules, which you could use to prove some theorem, and if those rules are such that you could put them on a computer, and, you, you, and it can tell you, you try this theorem and you see, is it true or not? You put the, uh, suggest that this set of rules that can be applied, and the computer chugs through and says, yes, it's been correctly applied, and therefore the thing is true, that sort of thing. And you have to believe that the rules do give you truths. That's part of the story. I mean, that's the point of them, after all. So you've looked at them each individually. And you said, does that really, do you believe that one? Yeah, that's okay. What about that one? Yep. What about that? Uh, oh, yeah, I see. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So yep. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the sort of rules you would use to prove. These are all statements about infinite numbers of things. Mm -hmm. Like if you add two even numbers, you get another even number. Right. Okay. That's a statement yeah, about... Yeah, yeah about an infinite number of things, yet you can prove it in a couple of steps. And using these rules, that would be very easy to prove. Okay, what Gödel does, as Steen described, and it's very clever, how you can make a statement, which when you look at how it's constructed, it really can be interpreted as, as saying, I am not provable by those rules. Right. So then you say, well, okay, maybe it's false. In which case it is provable by the rules, and since you've built up a trust that these rules really do only give you truths, then you know it's, it must actually be true that it's not proven by the rules and, and the statement is true. Yeah. So this is a, and it's a statement which is really about numbers, ordinary numbers. And it's a statement which you can see by virtue of your, that's the thing that I found stunning. By virtue of your belief that the rules only give you truths, you can see that this is true Nevertheless, it cannot be proved using the rules. Right. So it tells that there is, these rules, whatever they are, cannot encapsulate one's entire way of proving things in mathematics. And I found that absolutely amazing because it seemed to me that our understanding transcends any kind of rules. And I, well, I won't go into the whole story because it was complicated. I wrote about this in The Emperor's New Mind. I had huge numbers of complaints from various people. I wrote about it again in my book, Shadows of Mind, trying to indicate all these responses and things like that. So I won't go into the details of that. But it did strike me as rather remarkable that by our understanding of what the rules are saying enables us to transcend the rules. And this struck me as completely amazing. That somehow the understanding that one has isn't following the rules. There's something beyond that. And this transcending of these rules is a feature of our understanding. Right. So it seems to me that whatever understanding is, and I don't know what it is, <laughs> is some quality that we have 
which enables us to transcend any set of rules that you have for proving things in mathematics, yeah. and they're not enough. Yeah. But you can see by understanding them, you can go beyond them. Now, what does understanding involve? Well, it certainly involves consciousness in the normal usage of the words, yeah. because one says, you, know, to understand, you couldn't imagine something understanding a thing if it wasn't even aware of it. Yes. So being aware of something is a necessary ingredient. Surely not the whole story, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it doesn't say anything about the perception of the color blue, for yeah. example. Yeah. I mean, people complain to me, say, well, you're only talking about a very limited thing. Well, of course it is. But the point is, if what I'm saying has relevance to our understanding, it may not be relevant to all features of understanding. Sure, I'm quite happy with that. But nevertheless, it seems to indicate there's something outside computation in human understanding. And then I start talking about evolution, how it can happen, and what, how this... It's a feature of general understanding. It's not a very specific thing that mathematicians involve. You, uh, and you can present arguments in that direction too. So then I began thinking, okay, well, what kind of... I mean, I'm a physicalist, so I believe what's going in in our heads is obeying the same laws of physics which is going on around us. There's nothing, something special injected into our heads which is, gives us a quality which is beyond the laws of physics. I'm, I'm a physicalist. I believe it's the same physics in here as out there and everywhere. Yeah. Maybe different parts of our, are emphasized in different ways. So I began to think about what are the laws of physics as we know them or knew them at the time. I was thinking about this. Okay, well, Newtonian mechanics, you can put that on a computer. There's a little bit of a catch, which I always worried about a little, but I don't think it's the real answer. The catch is that all these laws of physics depend on the continuum. So you're really talking about properties of real numbers. Ah, oh, right. And real numbers are not things you quite put on the computer. You put approximations to them. Now, is there a catch in the fact that these are only approximations? I don't think that's the answer, but I'm prepared to admit that there's another route one might try to follow. Right, okay. I'm not following that route because I think the computer's are impressive enough. You can, you can get approximation as close as you like, and so I don't think that's the answer. But I'm prepared to uh, look at some suggestion which goes in the other direction. Okay, then I think about, okay, Newtonian mechanics, I think about Maxwell's electrodynamics. Yep. If you put all those things on the computer, I would think about Einstein's general relativity. I knew that was pretty hard at the time, it hadn't got very far, <laughs> but nowadays yep, yeah, you can yeah. talk about in spiraling black holes and you can, it's really very, very detailed what yeah. people do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. Then what about quantum mechanics? Well, Schrodinger equation, you can put that on a computer. It has a problem with how many variables you have to admit. Sometimes people regard it as a difficult problem for a complicated system, but it's not really fundamentally different. So the Schrodinger equation also. But that's not the whole of quantum mechanics. No. Quantum mechanics involves not just the evolution of the quantum state according to the Schrodinger equation, or whatever you like to call it, unitary evolution. It involves measurement. And the measurement problem is, violates Schrodinger equation. You evolve a state, and it says, if you made a measurement of such and such a type, it would give you a probability of that and a probability of this. If you evolve the measuring device as well as the system, then you get a contradiction, because it says that the answer of the measurement is a superposition of this and that. Schrodinger obviously worried about this yep. with his cat. <laughs> I mean, that's why he brought the cat into the discussion. <laughs> right, right. Really yeah, to yeah. show that there's something wrong here. There's something in the theory. I mean, people often say, well, maybe with a sufficient technicality we could build a Schrodinger's cat. That was not what Schrodinger's point was. He was saying this is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. You can't really have a cat which is dead and alive at the same time. Yeah, but it was a mere illustration of a wider point, right? That's yeah. right. So, so Schrodinger, and I'm well in line with Schrodinger's viewpoint on this. Einstein took a rather similar view. In fact, Dirac did too, even though he didn't, he didn't enunciate that. You have to see what his later, he didn't say much about what he thought about quantum mechanics, but he took a rather similar view. You see, quantum mechanics is incomplete. Right, right. Because right, right. it doesn't explain the collapse of the wave function. The Schrodinger equation is a, a smooth, continuous evolution of the state, yeah. but it's not what you get when yeah. you make a measurement. Yeah. When you make a measurement, which asks for broadening the system a bit to include the measuring apparatus and all that, why doesn't it follow the Schrodinger equation? And that worried Schrodinger very much. Mm -hmm. 
And, and um, it seems to me this is the, is the gap that's not present in all the other theories. See, all the other theories, right up to the point, even including the Schrodinger equation, or the evolution, unitary evolution in quantum mechanics, they are all things you could put on a computer. So where is there something that you couldn't maybe put on a computer? And the argument I was making here is that it's in the collapse of the wave function. Right. So there is some process, and I'm not taking the view as many people did in the early days of quantum mechanics, that it's the conscious observer looking at the system and observing, yeah, 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 yeah. that's the sort of terminology which suggests it's that, yeah. observing the system. No, I don't believe that. that you, it doesn't really work when you think about it in detail. I won't get into that, but, but it certainly doesn't really work. So I don't believe it's that. However, it's a different role for consciousness, almost the opposite. That whatever consciousness is depends <clears throat> upon what this currently unknown we know something about it, which is to do with seeing how general relativity relates to quantum mechanics. Right. But it's the other way around. It's not how you quantize general relativity, which is what many of my colleagues try and do. Right. It's the opposite, how you gravitize quantum mechanics. You try to put the principle of equivalence, these great principles of Galileo, into the theory and the Einstein way of resolving these principles of Galileo. Into, a, into an overall theory and imposing that on quantum mechanics. And you can see when you look at this that the arguments tell you that with certain mass displacements that the, the superposition of it being in one position or another has to go to one or the other in a certain time scale. Yep. And that sky and time scale you can estimate. Yeah. And so this, I claim, is what's going on in the brain. Ah. And there, and it, where in the brain? I had no idea. I learned a bit of neurophysiology. I just couldn't see where in the brain it could be doing it. Yeah. I rather sort of petered off in my The Emperor's New Mind and, without knowing the answer. But then uh, Stuart Hameroff, who was an anesthesiologist in, in Tucson in Arizona, yeah. and he wrote to me and said, more or less, evidently you don't know about microtubules. He didn't put it quite like that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. but he su he suggested there's something I mean, he was very interested in, in, in general anesthesia, and he realized that it's not a chemistry question. I mean, how you turn it off is a route into what it is. And what turns it off is not chemistry, because you have many, many substances, completely unrelated chemically, which are general anesthetics. One of the most striking being xenon, which is an inert gas, or more or less inert. <laughs> and it's, it's not chemical processes. It's some physical process. And, well, we've developed these ideas together, uh, going off on different routes and trying to come back again all the time, and uh, formulating a scheme which is referred to as the ORC, O-R, proposal. Yeah, 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 yeah. ORC means orchestrated. It's not the... O-R means objective reduction. So the reduction means the collapse of the wave function. Objective means it really is a physical process. And then there are curious features about when it happens, which is another whole story. Which is, a, which really is another got, question entirely. Yes, it's yeah. got very interesting, <clears throat> going back to experiments which I do describe in The Emperor's New Mind, due to Benjamin Libet. And there's some renewed interest in these things. You've already mentioned, for example, that you were taught by Dirac. Yes. Who, who, are the, who are the people that you enjoyed just personally working with or being taught by the most? It's complex. Well, there's one character when it comes to physics. You see, I was right. in Cambridge as a pure mathematician. Right, right. But the person I gained a lot of insights from into physics was Dennis Sharma. Now, Dennis Sharma was a good friend of my brother's, my older brother Oliver, who had worked in Cambridge doing graduate work there on right. many body systems, um, different area from what I worked in. But I got to know Dennis through my brother Oliver, and we rather hit it off, Dennis and I. Particularly, he was interested in cosmology, and I'd listened to Fred Hall's radio talks and was puzzled right, by them. And, right, right. And this led to... And Dennis decided that he was wanting me to switch subjects right. and work in cosmology. I never did that. I kept going with my what I was doing. Yeah. But I learned a lot of physics, and I learned... Dennis was very good at, at, 
and knowing physics and knowing the right people to talk to too. It was all the skills that he had were very influ very important to me. It sort of made me into a physicist, basically. Right. Well, I mean, maybe that takes us to a question of how it is that you approach the work that you do. So you've said in the past that you're quite a visual thinker. Yeah. What is, what is, I mean, so from everything from Penrose tiling all the way through to, you know, CCC, you know, views on cosmology, mm. views, you know, questions about human consciousness. What, what is the unifying theme of being a visual thinker? How does that feature in the way you do your work? It certainly is an important element to my thinking. And I remember when I was at school, I sort of thought I was better than most of my colleagues at mathematics. And then I thought, well, I feel like a bit of an oddball. And when I go to university, I will find people who think like me. That was not true. Right. What I found was there were more different ways of thinking about mathematics than I'd ever encountered before. But the main division, clearly, was whether you tended to think visually or in terms of equations. Right. And I was clearly one of the fairly small fraction of the class who was definitely a visual person. Right. It actually it didn't do me too well in a sense because in, at University College they had this way of doing the maths that to the first two years you actually took the exam, the main exam at the end of two years. It was right. a three-year course. Right. And the third year was to do your special topics. Okay. Now, in my third year, I specialized in the two geometry topics. Right. But when I learned later how well I did, I, my geometry papers were not my best paper. <laughs> the reason was that in algebra, it's easy because you, you can, I don't know if it's the real answer, but it's something like always you're using one side of the brain rather than crossing over from one to the other. Right, I right, don't know right. if it's as simple as that. Right. But with the, doing the geometry papers, I can see how to do the problem. Then I have to translate that into words, write it out in words, and then do it again. So it's all this going from one to the other and one to the other. And I was a slow writer, and I didn't finish the papers. Whereas in algebra, you can see it, so you don't have to switch around in that way. This is the question, problem, this is the answer. And <laughs> you just go like this. And so I did much better in my algebra paper than I did in geometry. So you, you've spoken about some of the people that you worked with and some of the people who taught you. Yes. Um, maybe now I could ask if there was anyone from the history of mathematics or physics or science more broadly that you would have liked to have met but never got the opportunity <laughs> to, who would you choose? Well, if we're talking about people from the whole of history, mm. I'd probably, t well, I, I don't speak Italian, but I'd choose, <laughs> I'd choose Galileo if I wasn't a... And why is that? I don't know. I always had a... I mean, people would say Newton and all that. But, but I mean, Maxwell would have been a good person too. And whether mm. I could have understood his Scottish accent. <laughs> he had a very strong brogue, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Galileo, I always had a feeling... I don't know if it was... How much of it was his trouble with the church and all that. And trying right. to battle the, the current views. But, but there were so many things which he understood, which people didn't... I mean, obvious things that think now. I mean, what, why pe one reason why people didn't believe in the Copernican theory is why don't you feel a swishing through this great speed? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You hanging <laughs> onto the chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Gallows points out, no, no, you don't feel anything. Yeah, Gallows <laughs> and, and, and the principle of equivalence. That, yeah. And I like the one with the fireworks. He imagines the fireworks and they make this beautiful sphere of sparks and it drops and it remains a sphere as it drops. You can cancel out gravity by falling freely. I mean, these beautiful principles that really so fundamental to physics. And this coupled with his fight against the authoritarian role of the, of the church. And, and that, that, I think that a lot of that was why he was my particular hero. Well, Roger, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. Okay. Though I wish we didn't because I have quite a lot more questions than I started with. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yes. But thank you very much. That okay. was hugely enjoyable. My pleasure.